Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the beginning of my fourth week of teaching on a subject that I've entitled, The War Is Over. I've got this book here, and I tell you, this is one of my favorite things to teach. This is just about the love of God, how that God isn't mad at us. He's not even in a bad mood. And we have it not only in book, but we have it in a Spanish book. We have CDs, DVDs, and study guides. And I think that probably five weeks will be the end of my series. So we're drawing towards the end of this series, talking about the war is over. I started from Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where the angels were singing and glorifying God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And people often inter interpret that as that's peace among men, but Jesus Himself said, Don't think that I came to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. From this time forth, a family will be divided, two against three, and on and on. Jesus Himself said it wasn't peace among men, but it was peace from God to man. That is huge. That is huge. And sad to say, the majority of the body of Christ hasn't got the message. They don't know that the war is over. They still think that there is wrath from God against us for our sins. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that God just all of a sudden decided He was going to quit holding people's sins against them. No, He paid for those sins through the Lord Jesus. It's like there had to be a holy God had to vent His wrath. He had to fulfill His will. He told Adam, In the day you eat, thereof you shall surely die. But when God's wrath fell, it's like a lightning bolt. Instead of it hitting uh, Adam and Eve, it hit that animal. And God killed the animal and took coats of skins and covered them. Likewise, the, the tr that was just symbolic, but the true payment for our sin is when the wrath of God fell and all of God's wrath came upon Jesus. John chapter 12, verse uh, 32, I believe it is, where he says that uh, when Jesus is lifted up, He will draw all, and I believe it's all judgment, unto Himself. And so all of God's wrath and all of God's judgment came upon Jesus. And because of that, God is now not imputing our sins unto us. Let me use this verse out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I've used these already. But in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. God used those verses to just totally revolutionize my life. And in verse 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. And here's how He reconciled us. The word reconcile means to make friendly again or to bring into harmony. Here's how God reconciled us unto Himself. It says, not imputing their trespasses unto them. But it's not like God just says, all right, sin no longer is going to be an issue. No, sin has always been an issue. It's not that God just says, I'm going to quit holding people's sins against them. No, sin had to be judged, but it was judged in the flesh of the Lord Jesus. It goes on to say that. The way He reconciled us unto Himself was by not imputing our trespasses unto us, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And here's how He reconciled us. Again, it's not that He just said, all right, I'm going to quit uh, being upset over sin. No, sin is an offense. God's nature is pure holiness, pure holiness. And God can't just sit there and say, well, I'm not going to uh, enforce holiness anymore because that's His nature. He would be denying Himself. He cannot deny Himself. Sin had to be judged, but instead of it being judged in you and in me when we do wrong, it says in the next verse, For He, speaking about God, hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God's nature is holiness. He cannot change. That is who He is. 
Just because we became unholy, God is not going to become unholy like us and just start lowering Himself to our standard. No, God is holy, but the way He was able to reconcile us, bring us back into friendliness and into harmony with Him, He judged sin in the flesh of Jesus. All of our sin was put upon Jesus and God's wrath was poured out and Jesus bore God's rejection. Jesus bore God's wrath. Jesus became sin for us. He didn't just take a little bit of sin. He became sin. He bore all of our sin for us and because of it, now God can treat us just as if we had never sinned. That's my little layman's definition of justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And that's what justified is. It means you are declared free from the guilt and penalty attached to grievous sins. You are, you are pure. In your spirit, you are a completely brand new person. And because of that, God is not holding sin against us. But sometimes people, when you hear about the goodness and the grace of God and the love of God, they think it's just because God just finally got over being mad. In the Old Testament, there was so much wrath. There was so much punishment. In the New Testament, you see grace and mercy. And sometimes people think, well, God just got over being mad. Now He's kind to everybody. No, God, His wrath, His holiness, His nature is against sin. God is holy. God is righteous. But He is also love. Love is His dominant characteristic. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God is love. And because of God's great love, He wanted to deal with us. He wanted, us to bring, he wanted to bring us back into harmony. But He couldn't just do it and say, all right, I'm going to change. And even though you're now unworthy, I'm going to love you anyway. No, He had to pay for that sin. And, but rather than us paying for it ourselves in a Christless eternity separated from God, He sent His Son. And His Son became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. I tell you, it's important that you understand this because sometimes people hear about the grace of God and they just think, well, God just changed. No, He didn't. Let me share some things with you here about the difference between the old and the new covenant. Did you know, if you don't properly understand this, you might think that God just was angry in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, there is a grace and there is a mercy, and so God just changed. No, he says, I'm the Lord. I change not. God hadn't changed. Now, he has changed in the way he deals with us because of the different covenants that he made with us. You know, let me just illustrate this by turning over here to 2 Kings chapter 1. And just for time's sake, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But in 2 Kings chapter 1 is where a king of Israel, Ahaziah, he got sick. He had fallen and injured himself, and there was something like an infection, maybe gangrene or something like that. And he was concerned about whether he would live or die. So he sent his servants not to the God of Israel, but to the God of Ekron, to Beelzebub. And he had his servants go and inquire whether he would recover from this. Well, the prophet of God, Elijah, intercepted the messengers. And he rebuked them and he said, because there is no God in Israel, is that the reason that you're going to Ekron and inquiring of this other God? And he says, you go tell the man that sent you, because he is not seeking after God, he's going to die and he will not get up off the bed that he's laid upon. So the messengers turned around and they came back so quickly that the king knew they didn't have time to get to Ekron. And so he says, why have you come back? And they said, there was a man that met us, and he said this, and they, get, they delivered that message. And he said, what kind of man was he? And they said, he was a hairy man and girt about with a leathern girdle. You know, apparently, uh, Elijah uh, was quite the fashion statement. People recognized him. I don't know if this is talking about that he was hairy, like had a lot of hair on his arms and things like that, or some of the commentaries I've read believe that he had a beard that was all the way down to his waist. But whatever, he was very recognizable. And as they described the prophet to the king, he says, it's Elijah. And the reason he knew it was as Elijah is because this king, Ahaziah, was the son of Ahab and Jezebel, the two worst kings that had ever ruled over Israel at that time. 
and they had had a run-in with uh, Elijah, and because of their sins, Elijah prophesied that the dogs would lick the blood of Ahab in the very place where he had stolen a uh, um, vineyard from Naboth and killed him. And where Naboth's blood was spilt, he says, the dogs will lick your blood in that very spot. And it came to pass. He was killed in a battle. They came down and brought the chariot down there to wash it out. And in the exact spot that the dogs had licked the blood of Naboth, they had licked the blood of Ahab. And Elijah prophesied that. He also prophesied that Jezebel would be eaten by the dogs and wouldn't even be buried, but that she'd be dung upon the ground. Well, I mean, the greatest insult that you could possibly give to a person. Now, that hadn't happened at this time, but it did come to pass. And anyway, Ahaziah knew that there was wrath against him and his house because of the sins of his father. And so he didn't sin to the God of Israel. Anyway, all of this... After he found out what Elijah had prophesied about him, he sent his uh, captains down to take Elijah. And in verse 9, it says, Then the king sent unto him a captain of fifty with his fifty, and he went up to him, and behold, he sat on the top of a hill, and he spake unto him, Thou man of God, the king has said, Come down. And Elijah answered and said to the captain of fifty, If I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy fifty. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. This is absolutely amazing. This is amazing that, you know, it, it, when, sometimes when we read things in the Bible, we just think, well, that's a Bible story. And somehow or another, we don't realize that it's real, that it really happened. Just think that if I was here and say because I was preaching and people got upset with me, I've had people send hate mail to me and, and do things to me. And anyway, let's say that somebody, a king, the, the president of the United States sent their people to arrest me. And if I was sitting out here on the deck of our thing and they said, come down, you're under arrest. And I said, if I'm truly a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and all of your people. And if a lightning bolt, if fire fell from heaven and just burn up 51 men, can you imagine what that would be like? I mean, the power, the authority, the judgment of God upon these people was amazing. And right after that, it says in verse 11, and again, also he, thou talking about the king Ahaz, Ahaziah sent unto him another captain of fifty with his fifty, and he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath the king said, Come down quickly. And Elijah answered unto them, If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee in thy fifty. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his fifty. You know, the first time this happened, some people might have thought, well, this was coincident. It wasn't really a divine judgment. It was just a lightning bolt, and it just happened to strike these people. But here, in the second instance, it specifically says, the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So this is 102 men that had been destroyed by the prophet calling fire down out of heaven and killed 102 men. That is wrath. That is judgment. That's not mercy. And then finally, the king sent a third captain with his 50 men, and this captain had enough sense to beg for mercy and plead for mercy. And so God told Elijah to go with him, and Elijah went and talked to the king, repeated his judgment, and God protected him, and he wasn't killed. He did not have to call fire down out of heaven and destroy these people. This was just a different covenant where the wrath of God was released. And let me show you the New Testament counterpart to this. In the ninth chapter of the book of Luke is an instance where Jesus was on His way to Jerusalem and He came to a city of Samaria. And it says in verse 51, this is Luke 9, 51, And it came to pass when the time was come that He should be received up, He steadfastly set His face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. And here's the reason they didn't receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. 
Now, to understand this, you've got to understand that the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. It was a religious and a racial prejudice, the two strongest prejudices that men have, religious and, relate, uh, and uh, race. And you can see there's examples where Jesus gave the story about the Samaritan that went and helped the man who was wounded and things like this, and there were many examples of this. And so, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. See, the Samaritans were forbidden to go to Jerusalem because they were a half-breed. They had intermarried, which was against the Jewish law, and so it was a racial thing. And also, they had perverted the worship of God, and so the Pharisees, the Puritans down in Jerusalem would not even let the Samaritans enter into the temple. They wouldn't let them worship with them. So the Samaritans had made their own temple, their own place of worship in Samaria, and there was this religious and re racial prejudice. Now, Jesus had already ministered to these people. You can read about that in the fourth chapter of the book of John where Jesus ministered to the woman at the well and told her that she had had five husbands and the man that she was now living with was not her husband. And uh, so she repented, received salvation. She went into the town. She brought the entire town of Samaria out and it says that many believed on Jesus. So these are the people. These people already knew who Jesus was. Jesus had ministered unto them. They had accepted Him as, sal as Savior, as the Messiah. They knew who He was, but when He came back through Samaria, because He was on His way to Jerusalem to worship with the Jews who the Samaritans hated, they rejected Jesus and wouldn't even let Jesus enter into their town. Now, you need to know that background to understand that this was total rejection of someone. They knew what they were doing. They knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but if He was going to associate with those hypocritical Jews, they wanted nothing to do with Him. And look at the reaction of Jesus' disciples in verse 54. And when His disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? They were going back to what we just read, 2 Kings chapter 1, about Elijah calling fire down out of heaven and killing these 102 people. And so they saw that what happened to Jesus was actually worse than what happened to Elijah. Because Elijah, finally, when he prayed about it, the Lord said, go with these men. I'll protect you. And he did. Elijah did not have to call fire down out of heaven. It wasn't in self-defense. It was just the wrath of God through the prophet Elijah being poured out on these people. But in this instance, these people were actually more guilty than Ahaziah was in 2 Kings chapter 1. They were more worthy of judgment because they knew who Jesus was. They had already received ministry from Him, and yet because He was going to associate with the hypocrites in Jerusalem, they were willing to reject Him. And Elijah called fire down out of heaven when it wasn't necessary. Here, the disciples felt more justified than what Elijah was, because this was a greater rejection. Those other soldiers were just doing their job. They weren't going to hurt him. But look at Jesus' reaction. In verse 55, He turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So Jesus said, No, we aren't calling fire down out of heaven. I didn't come to bring judgment. I came to bring mercy. I came to bear man's sins, not to enforce God's judgment upon their sins. So let me make a statement. This is a radical statement, but it'll illustrate the point that I'm trying to make. If Jesus would have been on the earth in His physical body in 2 Kings chapter 1, where Elijah called fire down out of heaven, if Jesus would have been here, Jesus would have rebuked Elijah for doing what he did. Now, am I saying that Elijah was wrong? No, because he was under another covenant. That's what I'm going to be explaining this week. I'm going to be showing you the reason why God gave this covenant of wrath and covenant of punishment in the Old Testament. But there was a different way of God dealing with people. I'm going to explain to you why He did that, but that is not the covenant 
that you and I live under today. When you try and enforce the old covenant wrath of God against sin in the New Testament, you would be rebuked by Jesus the same way that His disciples were. James and John were wanting to do exactly what Elijah had done, and they were rebuked for it. They were trying to emulate an Old Testament prophet, and they were rebuked for it. Today, we have many people in the church that are acting like an Old, pro uh, an old Testament prophet and standing up and pronouncing judgment. I was actually in a church one time where a person got up and gave a quote-unquote prophecy and said, the Lord is angry, the Lord is mad at you. That is not true. Now, under the Old Covenant, the wrath of God was revealed like that, but under the New Covenant, Jesus has totally made a difference. There is a different way of God dealing with people. God is not judging America. He's not judging any nation. Now, does that mean that we are free and that there's not going to be anything bad happen to us? No, we're in the process of destroying ourselves. We are in the process of yielding to the devil, and the Bible makes it very clear that the devil only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so Satan is in the process of destroying those who have forsaken God and have quit seeking God. There are still consequences to our sin, but God is not judging this nation. God is not judging you. We have a new covenant. There is a difference between the way things were done under the old covenant as evidenced in the way that Elijah called fire down from heaven and killed 102 men. And in the New Covenant, when people tried to do the exact same thing, they were rebuked for it. You are not. We, let me say it this way, we are ambassadors for the Lord, and we are not imputing men's sins unto them, and we are not releasing the wrath of God and prophesying the wrath of God over people. That is not the new covenant that we have. And sad to say, I think most Christians have not understood this. They don't really recognize the difference between the old and the new covenant. To the vast majority of people, the only difference between the old and the new covenant is a blank page in their Bible. And it just shows that, you know, they just think it's all one thing. No, there's a reason it's called the Old Testament and the New Testament, because God has now made a different covenant, a different contract with us, all because of Jesus. Jesus totally changed everything. So this week, I'm going to be helping you to understand the covenants and the way that God has changed His dealings with us. God hasn't changed, but He has changed His dealings with us because His wrath was poured out upon Jesus. The war is over. This book would really be a blessing to you. I encourage you to get it. I've also got it in Spanish. We've got CDs, we've got DVDs, we've got a study guide. Our announcer will give you all of the information about the different ways you can get this teaching, but I promise you, this would be a blessing to you. So listen to our announcer. Please call or write today and join me again tomorrow for the Gospel Truth.